morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there, um, including my own mother, if you're watching this later. Um, I know that I don't call my mom enough to tell her that I love her and uh, let her know how appreciative I am of all the things that she did to raise me when I was a hellion. Um, I don't know how much I've changed since then, but uh, I'm standing up here, so I guess a little bit. Um, but I'm um, very thankful for all you mothers and all that you guys do. If you would um, turn in your Bibles this morning, we're going to continue in Luke. And it's in chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. And if you have your pew Bibles, it's on page 1,627 and I think 1,628 as well. So if you remember from last week, Jesus healed uh, ten lepers as he was journeying toward Jerusalem. And as he traveled there and as he healed these men, he revealed God to be a God of mercy and a God of salvation. As he not only delivered them from their physical ailments, from that leprosy that was um, ailing them, but also he healed a Samaritan leper from his bondage of the soul, that sickness of sin that was encroaching upon him as he fell before Jesus' feet and believed in the one who had healed him as he rested his faith in Jesus. And today Jesus is asked a question by Pharisees concerning the kingdom of God and its coming as he continued his journey toward Jerusalem. And his answer to the religious leaders is rather short uh, because of their inability to see the kingdom. But then Jesus turns to his disciples and teaches them important realities to be attentive to as they wait for the fullness of the kingdom of God brought on by the coming of the Son of Man. And so let's turn our ears to what God is speaking to us today through His Son, Jesus, as we read from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. And just a note before I begin, in my translation in the ESV, it skips verse 36. And so if you notice that, don't worry. It's just a translation thing in some of the Bibles, and so all the information that's important is there, so don't worry about it. So, uh, this is God's Word from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let no one, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. This is God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, it's a good day to be gathered and worship. And Lord, what a wonderful set of worship it was to reflect upon your holiness and also as we come to your word, recognizing that uh, Jesus is speaking of uh, only what he can do as the Son of Man in coming and returning to make all things right and bringing perfect justice and equity upon the earth. And so, Lord, we 
look to your word. We ask that you would help us to receive it and understand it so that we can not just listen to it, but that we can apply it to our hearts and into our lives so that we can be ready and expectant of your return. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So early on in Luke's gospel, Jesus encountered a lame man that is brought into a home by some of his friends. And that lame man is lowered down into the house. And Jesus declared this man's sins to be forgiven. And then a brouhaha happened with Pharisees there. And uh, he was rebuked by them because he had exercised authority on God's behalf that they thought that only God had the right to exercise. And in the conclusion of that teaching moment, Jesus uses a title for himself for the first time in Luke's gospel account. He uses the title, the Son of Man. As we read in Luke 5, 24 through 25, he says this, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Now this title had divine connotations or implications. It meant that when Jesus used it of himself, he was showing his unique authority as the Messiah to work on God's behalf and express God's authority. And he did many works of healing and forgiving of sins just as he did with the lame man in this authority. But he also cast out demons by the authority of God, such as in Luke chapter 11 when Jesus had another encounter with the Pharisees and they called him the prince of demons. And again, when Jesus answered the religious leaders in that scenario, he said these words to rebuke them. He said in Luke chapter 19 and 20, he said, If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, that's the prince of demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I mention these two scenarios together because in our present text, we find that the kingdom of God and the Son of Man are inherently linked together. You cannot find the kingdom of God without the one who brings that kingdom. And as the Pharisees asked Jesus about the kingdom, it's clear that they wanted the kingdom of God without the kingdom bringer. Which is why they missed the kingdom of God's uh, coming, even, if it, even as it was coming to fruition right under their nose. And as disciples of Jesus, we don't want to be blind as the Pharisees were. Rather, we want to behold the kingdom of God. And today we're going to behold the kingdom of God first by seeing it in our midst. And then second, by looking for its revealing. Sort of see it in our midst. So the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. And his answer to them was one we should expect at this point. He points out to the Pharisees that the kingdom of God is not going to be perceived by them in, the way, in ways that were extraordinary to their eyes. They weren't even going to see it at all. They couldn't observe it. In verse 20 he says this, Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be Observe, the Pharisees were so spiritually blind to the kingdom of God that they did not even recognize that its foundations were being laid right in front of their eyes by Jesus. They had no perception of the kingdom's cornerstone. The Jesus who could speak and cleanse not just one leper, but ten by a mere word. The Jesus who was the Holy One of God that purged demons from their humanly habitations by a mere spoken word of his tongue, and the Jesus who said, Arise to the corpse of a widow's son, and then raised him to life and returned him to his mother at the gates of Nain. This was the Jesus, the Son of Man, the Messiah of God, who stood before them, and they did not observe him as he was, because they desired an earthly kingdom, a kingdom that was not heavenly. You see, the mustard seed of the kingdom was growing as they dully asked Jesus about the kingdom's coming. The leaven of the kingdom was spreading all throughout Judea and was heading toward Jerusalem along with Jesus. The narrow door of the kingdom of God had opened its mouth to them, inviting them to enter, but they had refused time and time again. It was not that the kingdom of God could not be seen by the Pharisees. It was not that the kingdom was unable to be discerned by them. It was that they did not have ears to hear 
or eyes to see the kingdom of God that was manifest in the person and work of Jesus who was reminding them of the inability of them to perceive what was right before their very eyes. The kingdom of God was in their midst, as we read again in verse 20 and 21. It says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And at times, it can be difficult for us to see the kingdom of God in our midst, isn't it? We can enter the dangerous realm of Christian autopilot, where we're going through the religious motions of our Christian duty of coming to church week in and week out, but we aren't really paying any attention to what's going on spiritually around us. Or we're so focused on our own agenda, we fail to observe the power of God at work in the midst of the congregation. Sometimes we live our Christian lives like a familiar drive where we end up at home or in the garage in our driveway and we have no idea how we actually got there. Do you remember how and why you made it to the pews you're sitting in this morning? Or why you're listening to the live stream on your sofa this morning or later on YouTube, wherever you're at? I pray that it's because you know that the kingdom of God is present here in our midst. And you want to encounter the Jesus on which it is being built. But if you're like me, critical of most things in my life, I can tend to focus on what things are not happening concerning the kingdom of God. I've been guilty of looking past the clear manifestations of Jesus at work in our midst uh, in many ways. See, COVID-19, as we all know, hindered our church life for months and has kept us all from firing on every single ministry cylinder for some time. But even in the most isolating and uncertain times of the past year, Jesus has been working in our midst. And if you haven't seen the power of God that is at work in the midst of this church, you need to open your eyes. See, the worship team and tech team have worked together in leaps and strides to improve our worship experience. And the fact that we've been open in worshiping is testimony as well to the kingdom's work in our midst. And yes, there are hiccups in our worship and with the tech stuff, but overall they're doing an excellent job. The Lord brought college students to us, many college students who long to hear and know the truth of God's word, to worship with us over this past year. Every Monday night I listen to the earnest prayers of a few saints who make me weep because of their unsatiated desire to see the advancement of God's kingdom come upon the community of Jefferson and abroad. People are serving their brothers and sisters with meals and manpower. They're mowing lawns and putting up drywall. There are small groups where people are growing in their knowledge of God, the Bible, and how to be men and women of God. There are youth who are becoming zealous for the truth of God's word and of his gospel, in large part due to the faithfulness of their youth group leaders. We welcomed 13 new members to our body just a few weeks ago, and there are more to come. Individuals have stepped up to lead VBS, and many others are helping out. There's a tutoring center, there's a food bank every month, and the trustees are doing all sorts of work. And we're beginning to watch the fear and oppression of a virus that has hindered our full expression of love toward one another dissolve with each passing week. Jefferson Baptist Church, do we see the kingdom of God in our midst? Amen. 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 It's a soul-refreshing thing to witness Jesus' body not just surviving, but beginning to thrive again. And it's true that there may be less people in these pews than there were at one time, but I believe they will be filled again soon. But we must open our eyes to see and behold the kingdom of God in our midst so that we may be inspired to press forward in our upward calling to be the mature and complete picture of Christ Jesus that we are called to be. We need to look close so that we behold it here in our midst. And if you have yet to experience the love of the kingdom and how it is spreading here at Jefferson, don't stand at a distance, but press into your brothers and sisters in Christ. The time for living under a spirit of fear and apprehension has passed. So let's pursue spirit-empowered fellowship as we perceive the kingdom of God together. Let us continue to see it in our midst. It is here. 
And let us not just sit in awareness of the fact that it is here that Christ is among us. Let us give glory to Him and honor as it's due. Praise God for being the God He has promised to be by working in our midst. So we must behold the kingdom of God by seeing it here among us. We must not be blind to the word and gospel of Jesus moving here as the Pharisees were blind to perceive the kingdom right before them. As we see the kingdom of God in our midst, it can strengthen us and allow us to be prepared to look for its revealing in other ways. And so we must behold the kingdom of God first by seeing it in our midst. We must also behold the kingdom of God second by looking for its revealing. So Jesus changed his focus from the Pharisees to the disciples. And he keeps a serious tone. But instead of repeating what he said to the Pharisees about not being able to see the kingdom, he goes through a much more detailed explanation of how they were going to be able to look for the revealing of the kingdom. And the way Jesus chooses to describe the kingdom's establishment has to do with the revelation of the Son of Man. And so Jesus began his prophetic teaching to the disciples here with a warning to be cautious first and foremost about false sons of man who would come to derail them from their perceiving of Jesus' revelation. So in verse 22 through 24 we read this. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, Look there, or look here, do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. The final revealing of the kingdom would not come with those who falsely claimed the authority of God. Jesus was going to come and when as he described to his disciples, which would make it much easier for them to turn away from those who tried to convince them to follow some new person or thing that appeared to be as Jesus and his kingdom. And because the disciples had eyes to see and ears to hear, they would be able to perceive the true coming of the Son of Man and resist the false promise of his kingdom's final establishment that was trying to be perceived by the Pharisees as a mere earthly kingdom through some type of a military power that was advancing. It wasn't going to come that way. It was a heavenly kingdom, one that was hidden as leaven among the dough. You see, for it was easy, it would be easy for them to observe for them with their spiritual eyes, as easy as observing lightning flashing across the sky, like it is so easy for us to see it on a, a, you know, a humid summer night where the clouds are gathering and the lightning flashes as we also hear the thunder roll. We must keep our eyes open to those who offer us a kingdom that appears to be of light. But the halls behind its iron gates hold a chalice of theological poison and relational division. You see, the new visions of Marxist utopia that are being offered in our society by woke Christians and secular social justicians alike will not aid the coming of the Son of Man. They offer us a worldly kingdom, not the kingdom of heaven that will come in its full righteousness and justice by the Son of Man. And may we ever be diligent to turn away from the divisive ideologies they offer, as shimmering gold, but is nothing more than an empty coffin for our souls. You see, we must not listen to any who say, look here or look there. That is, anyone who speaks a message to us that is contrary to the word of Scripture and the gospel of our Lord. We must not listen to them. Because a kingdom sought, whose cornerstone is not Jesus and his gospel of peace, is a kingdom that will lead to death. And the day of Christ's return is coming. And so we must be vigilant. See, Jesus continued teaching his disciples and explained to them that the kingdom's establishment would not come immediately. The Son of Man would only come after a specific event happened. And we see this in verse 25. He says, but first... He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. The Son of Man's coming that Jesus prophetically is warning His disciples about here would take place in a general time frame following His death, His burial, His resurrection, and His ascension. They would have to wait for His coming, and we are waiting for His coming as well. 
But the victory of Jesus as the risen and glorified king of the universe will allow him to have the preeminent authority to return not as a child or as a rabbi in humble form of mundane humanity, but in the power and majesty of the glorified God-man, the Son of Man. The final establishment of the kingdom of God would be in power and judgment as he comes on the clouds with fire. And it would be as the day of the Lord, just as it was in the day of of Noah and of Lot, as we read in verse 26 through 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came up and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The day of the Son of Man that Jesus foretold his pupils was a day of harrowing yet unexpected wrath for those who neglected the warnings of its coming. And the first illustration our Lord used to explain this was the days that the Rains came down and the floods came up. It was the day of Noah. You see, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He warned of the wrath that was going to submerge the entire world in a watery grave as he worked on the ark. And everyone who did not heed his warnings was destroyed, as we read in Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock. Beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things, and, and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. And the second example Jesus used to illustrate what the coming of the Son of Man would be like was the day that Sodom and Gomorrah burned from fire and sulfur that rained down upon it from heaven. The people had no care for righteousness. They disregarded Lot's good character that bore witness of righteousness. They had no thought of God or what was morally good or morally evil. They merely lived to do what it was they desired by eating, drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, as Jesus said. <coughs> They were ignorant of the judgment of God that was bearing down upon them from above. <coughs> and the disciples heard what Jesus said, and they took these warnings to heart and applied them in their day. You see, as they waited at the coming of the Son of Man, uh, they were serious about it, and they uh, delivered what Jesus said as a warning as well. We read earlier in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-10 through 10 in our unison scripture, an almost identical thing. From Peter as he spoke to the church that he wrote to concerning the coming of the Lord. And as modern disciples, we should take our cue from Jesus and Peter as we look for the revealing of the kingdom of God in our own day. We must be aware that we are looking, what we are looking for is not always what we desire to see. We don't like to admit that there are people who lie and are false teachers of the truth. Men and women who are ignorantly or purposefully desiring to pull faithful Christians away from Christ. As they say, look here or look there at the newest modern philosophical inventions of Jesus and his kingdom that our godless society entices them with. We are often hesitant to express the reality that there are people both inside and outside the church who do not desire to listen to what is spoken in truth and righteousness. And nor do they have any desire to act in accordance with what is consistent with the law of Christ, which is the word of God written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit who resides in us by faith. And it's sad to watch as people so clearly do not care about anything but their own pleasures and going about their own day. But the most unloving thing we can do is ignore this and not speak the truth in love to our neighbor about the final establishment of the kingdom of God that is coming when Jesus returns. Because if these people have not accepted Christ or persist in doing evil, they will not keep their life. 
as Christ says in the concluding portion of his teaching in verses 31 through 37, we read this. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whatever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. We desire to behold the kingdom of God and look for its revealing, because if we have eyes of faith, we will be able to perceive its coming and then embrace it. Rather than attempting to flee the coming of our Lord, we should look on at the revealing of His kingdom and we should not turn back to worldly pleasures or the comforts of what our material wealth brings us as the man who was on top of his house was called not to go back to get his wealth, as the man was in the field not called to turn back and go into his house. We're called to meet our Lord. We want to go to Him as He comes. And Jesus presented a solemn memory to the disciples here as well as a warning of what the love of this world will bring to them if they choose to embrace it instead of the coming of their Lord. He says, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife yearned for the things of Sodom and Gomorrah more than the freedom and salvation that God had brought to her and her family. She looked back against the warnings of the angels and became a pillar of salt, as Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 through 26 says. <clears throat> then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. On the day the Son of Man returns, we should not be taken aback or ashamed of His coming. We should want nothing more as His disciples than to watch His radiant lightning-like glory sweep across the skies as He returns because we will receive our eternal life as promised through our pursuit of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to be faithful to Him in this life. As followers of Jesus, we should wait in anticipation as we look for the kingdom's revealing. Because we do not want to turn back from it. But embrace it in its fullness. And the son of man who brings it. At times this can be difficult. Because we grow weary of waiting. We don't know when Jesus will come. And he will come at a time we do not expect. It may be at night. When we're at rest in bed with our beloved wife. Or our husband. It may be during the day we're at work. Alongside our co-workers. That they are taken to judgment by the Lord. Which is why continuing in faithfulness to our call to be disciples is so urgent. Because we never know when our Lord is coming. We want to make sure we have been diligent to share His gospel of salvation with everyone that we are in relationship with. So that they do not end up where Jesus, answering the disciples' final question so vividly, Depicted through a common but grotesque proverb as he says this in verse 37. And they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. If you have not rested your faith in Jesus, turn from your sin and believe in him today. For the day is coming, a day we must be ready for. When he appears like lightning to bring forth perfect justice to all mankind, both the living and the dead. And on that day, if you have not rested your faith in his name, you will be among those corpses, those sentenced to physical and spiritual death upon the cosmic battlefield where Christ alone is the victor. So repent and rest your faith in Jesus Christ, the risen and glorified Lord of all the earth, and receive the peace that comes through salvation in His name. You see, we must desire to behold the kingdom of God. And first, we must be desire it as we uh, are aware of seeing it in our midst. 
We want to be encouraged by it, strengthened by it, so that we can hold up against the weightiness of what it is to wait the long coming of our Lord, and may He come quickly. And then we must behold the kingdom of God as we look for its revealing. And we are in a time when it appears the kingdom of God might be close at hand. So let us keep our eyes open so that we might not fail to embrace the final establishment of the kingdom of God when the Son of Man is revealed and He returns on the clouds with glory. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Although it is a hard word, Lord, it is a good word so that we can be reminded to be strengthened, to pay attention and see all that's happening in our midst by your hand, by the power of your spirit and through your gospel. And Lord, we praise you for it. And Lord, we also ask that you would give us strength, encourage us by your spirit to be able to perceive the times in which we live so that we can be aware of the wickedness that's going on around us and that we may not succumb to it, but that we may hold steadfast and look for your coming, the true coming that you promise in your word. Lord, give us grace to be ready as you return. We ask it in the name of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.